You are listening to the St. John's Diamond Creek Podcast. This episode presented by Senior Minister Tim Johnson. The reading is taken from Romans chapter 2, verse 17 to chapter 3, verse 8. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonour God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and circumcision are a lawbreaker. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Their condemnation is just. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when I was about 20 years old, my friend Matt and I used to door knock the streets around our church. We do it on a Sunday afternoon before youth group and church as a way of engaging people in conversations about Jesus and inviting them to come to church. So he'd walk up one side of the street and I'd do the other and we'd see how we went. Well, one afternoon I knocked on a door and an older man opened it. Hi there, my name's Tim and I'm visiting from the local church. No, thank you, he quickly replied, and he started to close the door. We're Anglicans. Fantastic, I said. I'm actually from the local Anglican church, St Andrews, just down the road. Uh, Is that where you go or are you involved somewhere else? Look, I'm just not interested, and he promptly shut the door in my face. Now, I remember being a bit bemused by that interaction at the time. Uh, He gave himself a label. I'm an Anglican, but he wasn't interested in involvement in the Anglican church. And he certainly wasn't interested in talking about Jesus with some passionate 20-year-old standing on his front doorstep. 
Uh, maybe he thought I was a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness, and that was his way of escape. But what did it mean for him to call himself an Anglican? He probably ticked it on the census. He might have thought that it made him a respectable person. He might have thought that God would accept him on the basis of his identification as a Christian or an Anglican. Would he? If that man had died later that night and at the gates of heaven, God had said to him, why should I let you in? How successful would the answer, well, I'm an Anglican, be? Through the opening chapters of Romans, we've been seeing the need that all people have for the gospel. The gospel is the good news about Jesus, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. We need the good news of Jesus because humans fall short of who God has made us to be and we don't relate to him rightly as our maker. And so Paul, the writer of Romans, has been building a case that all people need the good news of Jesus. Humans stand under the right and just judgment of God because of our rejection of God. And Paul's argument has been systematically showing this need. He started in Romans 1, 18 to 32 by addressing the they, they out there, humankind in general who don't know God and who act wickedly. The target here is likely to be non-church Gentiles who lived flagrant godless lifestyles. Then last week in Romans 2, 1 to 16, he addressed the you. He addressed church-going moral people, Gentiles or Jews, who judge others for their wild living and yet who themselves are under God's judgment because they don't fully obey God and are self-righteous in the process. And today, Paul comes to address his fellow church-going Jews. In Romans 2, 3, he said, you are mere human being. And in Romans 2, 17, he says, now you, if you call yourself a Jew. He's narrowing down even more tightly, addressing a third group of people or maybe a subgroup within the you group. And the question today is, do religious people need the good news of Jesus? Isn't it enough to just follow religious rules uh, to keep the law? Isn't it enough to undertake religious rituals to be circumcised? If you do keep the rules and you follow these religious rituals, does that mean that you can avoid God's judgment? Well, let's consider those things one at a time. So firstly, is it enough to follow the rules? Well, in verses 17 to 20, Paul grabs the attention uh, of a religious Jewish person by using eight verbs which help to identify the religious person and what they might depend on. He starts in verse 17. If you call yourself a Jew, this is about how you identify yourself, you know, like our Anglican friend. I'm an Anglican. I'm religious. I'm a Christian. I'm a born again Christian or whatever. What label do you give yourself? If you rely on the law, this is a bit like treating God's law as a, as a shield to protect you. Uh, I have God's law, God's word, and that makes me religious and makes me okay. And boast in God. Okay, you believe that there's a God, not like those atheists over there, but more than that, you boast that you have a relationship with God. You're one of his people. If you know his will and approve what is superior, that is, you know what the moral rules are that God has laid out in his law and you approve of them. They're good. They're superior to other ways of living because you have been instructed by the law, okay? You've been well taught. You went to Sunday school or maybe a Christian high school, uh, maybe you had SRI, or you've been sitting in church for decades and you've heard countless sermons. If you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in dark, 
an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children. So not only have you been well taught, but you feel that you're able to teach other people too. People who don't know God's word and haven't been as well taught as you. Because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. So this is a pretty high standard of a religious person that Paul is addressing here. Maybe he even has himself in mind. He was a well-taught Pharisee within Judaism. So we're talking about a highly qualified religious person who surely, with all of these credentials, wouldn't stand under God's judgment, would they? Or they wouldn't need rescue and help from Jesus, would they? Well, yes, Paul says in verses 21 to 24, you do. You see, it's not enough to just know all the rules and even be able to teach the rules to others. You have to keep them and you have to keep them consistently and perfectly. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonour God by breaking the law? Paul challenges his readers, are you practising what you're preaching? Is there any hypocrisy in your life where you say one thing but do another? Now, a religious person will often say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm pretty good and I'm a lot better than that person over there. I'm sure that I'm good enough for God. I mean, I've never killed anyone and I've been faithful in my marriage. Uh, we can tend to fix the standard of what we think is good enough and fix it at a level that we can satisfy. But Paul is no doubt drawing on Jesus' own teaching here when he asks these questions. As Del reminded us last week, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, it's not enough just not to murder. If you hate another person in your heart, then you've broken that commandment not to murder. And it's not enough just not to commit adultery if you lust after another person, including stimulating your lust through images that you look at or through books that you read, then you've also broken that commandment. Paul probably has a similar high standard in mind when he speaks here of idols and robbing temples. Um, he likely means this figuratively and not just literally. It's unlikely that his fellow Jews were undertaking nighttime raids on temples to steal the statues so that they could worship them. Because we may not bow down to physical statues, but we do give our time, attention, money and service to things like materialism, to status, to personal glory and ambition, to commercial success. So Paul here, like Jesus before him, is turning the blowtorch on the religious person who thinks that they'll be right with God by keeping all the rules. And he issues the challenge, how are you really going with that rule keeping? Or have you just lowered the bar? Uh, sometimes in tests at school or at uni, uh, you get to mark your own work rather than someone else marking it. And it's always tempting when you're doing this to give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Well, that's close enough. That's kind of right. Yeah, I'll, I'll mark that as correct. Or, or sure, that might actually be wrong, but I know the correct answer, so I'll, I'll give myself half marks or something like that. And we can do that with ourselves morally as well. Oh, yeah, sure, I was angry with that person and I shouted at them, but I was really tired at the time and, and they were being really annoying. So I won't mark myself wrong for that particular behaviour. See, this is the problem with religious moralism, the approach that thinks that we can be okay with God because of our good performance. It can make us smug 
I'm a good person. It can make us oversensitive to criticism. You see, if my goodness is what makes me righteous, then I've got to defend it. And if someone criticizes me or calls into question my behavior, then I need to attack them and defend my own performance. It can make us judgmental. If I'm trying really hard to keep God's laws, but falling short, as we all do, if we're honest, I can at least retreat to the standard that I'm doing better than she is or than he is. And so I critically judge other people's performance and their motives to ensure that I see myself as better than they are. And it also makes us anxious. See, If it's down to my ability to keep the law of God, then have I done enough? See, I might try and defend my performance. I might criticize others, but there still remains this existential angst. What if I haven't done enough? Will God really accept what I've done? Will my self-marked test actually pass when it's scrutinized by the by the true judge? Well, Paul's conclusion in verse 24, where he quotes from Ezekiel 36, is is not encouraging. As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Is it enough to keep religious rules? No, because no one can actually do it. And the level of performance is so poor that God's name is actually brought into discredit when we claim that we're doing it well enough. So religious rule keeping is not enough because no one can actually do it. So what about religious rituals, right? If we perform the right rituals in the right way with the right attitude, will that be enough to satisfy God and to avoid his judgment? Well, in verse 25, Paul turns his attention to circumcision, the key religious ritual within Judaism for marking out God's people as belonging to him. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant or agreement between God and his people Israel. Now, in the ancient world, when you made a covenant with someone, you often had an outward and visible sign that you used to symbolize the agreement. So people might take a handful of dirt and put it on their head saying, if I break the covenant, may I become as this dust. Or they might cut an animal in half and walk between the pieces saying, if I break the covenant, may I die as this animal has. That's what Abraham does in Genesis 15 when God makes a covenant with him. And in circumcision, Some of a man's flesh was cut off in a very personal and intimate way. It was a physical marker of belonging to God as his covenant people, but it was also a symbol that if we break the covenant, then we will be cut off. Now, circumcision was and still is a key symbol for Jewish faith, and Paul doesn't want to dismiss it. In verse 25, he starts by saying, circumcision has value. And then again in chapter 3 verse 1, he reasserts this. What advantage then is there in being a Jew or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. But Paul says circumcision is only valuable if you keep the law. So back to verse 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So the religious symbol marks you out as God's person and committed to God's law. But then if you fail to keep God's law, then the symbol becomes meaningless. And in verse 26, Paul says that if a person isn't circumcised but does keep the law, then it's as if they are circumcised. Uh, This may be sounding familiar to you. Uh, It sounds similar to what Paul was saying about the law written on people's hearts, that God's law is inbuilt to us as people in some way because we're all made in the image of God 
And so our consciences direct us to know God's law, even if we don't have God's law written down for us. What that means is that all of us are accountable to God for what we do. What Paul is emphasizing here is the importance of the inward over the outward. And this becomes clearer in verses 28 to 29. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. So religious symbols and rituals are outward signs. But if they don't match the inward reality, then they're hollow and meaningless. Uh, They can be treated like magic. If I do this religious thing, then I'll be acceptable to God. And it doesn't matter what the rest of my life or my behaviour looks like. And let's be clear, this is not limited to circumcision. People can do this with baptism. Uh, People can do this with wearing uh, crosses around their neck. Uh, People can do this by attending church at Christmas time or at Easter time or attending church every week. Uh, People can do this by thinking that if I have a particular religious experience, feeling positive towards God uh, as I sing worship or uh, as I go to some Christian camp or convention, uh, that that is what puts me right with God. Or people can look back on a decision that was made in their younger days where they signed a commitment card or came forward or put their hand up at something. People can look at areas where they're serving God, the things they do for God, and and tick off those things thinking God will accept them. Now, all of these things are valuable, but they are outward signs, and the really important thing is the inward reality of a relationship with God. Paul describes the inward reality here as circumcision of the heart by the spirit. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, remember what circumcision symbolised. If I don't keep the covenant, then I deserve to be cut off, cut off from God and cut off from his people. But Paul's been arguing for two chapters now that everyone, absolutely everyone, fails to keep God's law. So everyone deserves to be cut off from God and everyone stands under his judgment. So what hope is there for us? Well, the hope for us is Jesus. Jesus is the only person who consistently and perfectly kept the law of God. He never failed. And yet, as he hung on the cross, he took our sin upon himself. He was cut off. He was abandoned by God. He experienced the full judgment and wrath of God. He was cut off, abandoned, and judged so that we don't have to be. This is how Paul puts it in Colossians 2.11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. So as we are united to Jesus, our whole sin-stained self is cut off. We're united to Jesus and included in the people of God. And Jesus pours the Holy Spirit into our hearts to transform us from the inside out so that with his help, we'll be able to keep God's law and desire to keep God's law. Right? Our sin-hardened hearts fail to keep God's law. We can't do it. And external religious rituals can't penetrate inwards in order to transform our hearts. They can't do it. We need Jesus. We need his 
perfect rule keeping and love inspired God honoring perfect life to achieve what we can't do on our own. And we need the transformation of the Holy Spirit. So having come to Jesus, we are changed from the inside out. Our our hearts are circumcised by the Spirit. Our hearts of stone are removed and replaced with hearts of flesh. Now, all this will be spelled out in much more detail as we continue through Romans, as Paul unpacks the wonder and the beauty of the gospel. But what is absolutely clear as we reach this point in chapter 3 is that all of us, every single one of us, and without any exception, needs the gospel. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. You know, the godless, wild living, self-seeking person needs Jesus. The morally respectable and self-righteous person needs Jesus. The mildly religious, moderately religious, fastidiously religious person needs Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. Whatever category we find ourselves in, we all need Jesus. We can't consistently and perfectly keep religious rules. But Jesus has done that for us. We can't rely on religious rituals like some magical protection to help us. They're outward signs, but we need the inward reality of hearts that are transformed by the Holy Spirit. We need to be changed from the inside out. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek.